90.3 WHPC now presents Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now, learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property and learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau, a past dean of the Nassau Academy of Law and frequently lectures to lawyers on ethics and avoiding problems with clients and to the public on how to choose and use lawyers. This is Law You Should Know on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hi, this is Ken Landau and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today we'll be talking about bankruptcy during covid what individuals or small business owners should consider when considering bankruptcy as an option or other alternatives to bankruptcy when dealing with COVID financial issues. Our special guest is Andrew Thaler. He's a lawyer in private practice in Westbury. He also is a trustee of the bankruptcy court and has been so for 30 years and is a past chair of the bankruptcy committee of the Nassau County Bar Association. He also is very involved in the bankruptcy courts, the field of bankruptcy, and the Bar Association of Nassau County. Andy, welcome back to Law You Should Know. Thank you, Ken. Because of COVID, the present, immediate past, and the future, many individuals and families and small businesses are considering their options when it comes to bankruptcy. When is someone, when is a good time for someone to consider consulting with you about bankruptcy or financial distress planning as an option? Certainly when uh, people are unable to pay their debts when they become due, that's the time to talk to somebody about the situation. Other things that we look for are when people are borrowing money from their pensions and retirement accounts to pay bills, They might otherwise be able to save those monies, tapping into home equity loans to pay bills. They may be able to preserve the equity in their house, borrowing money from one credit card to pay another, exhausting all their credit cards, being default on their home mortgage or a business loan, certainly getting dunning letters and calls from collection agencies, creditors and attorneys, um, being sued for money that you don't dispute, but you simply can't pay. Um, and generally, whether you're concerned about keeping your home or your business, which for most people are their most important assets. If people are getting dunning letters from credit card, from creditors and credit card companies, especially if it's about COVID-related medical bills, should they take action to protect their rights? Well, they certainly, certainly can sit on their rights, and they certainly shouldn't ignore if they get uh, sued in an action because the full judgment could be, could be taken against them. So uh, certainly if they've been uh, sued or they're getting letters, they should take uh, some uh, proactive measures. Now, at the present time, bankruptcy filings are down. Why is that? And what do you think will happen in the future? After uh, COVID, uh, you know, hit us in you know March to April, uh, we saw about a 50% decrease in the Chapter 7 filings. And the reasons for that were numerous. Um, the government put into place uh, foreclosure moratoriums on federally backed mortgages. Uh, student loans, federal student loan collections uh, stopped. Uh, there were state court moratoriums on debt collections and uh, rent evictions. Um, as many people know, there was a one-time CARES Act uh, cash payment, the stimulus. Um, businesses were provided with uh, PPP loans. Um, uh, people were getting, uh, particularly in New York, enhanced unemployment benefits. They received not only the state uh, benefits, but they received the federal benefit where some people were actually making more money being unemployed than they were being employed. Um, People also had a fear of when they were out of work or they were underemployed or accumulating more debt after they filed the bankruptcy, which would not be discharged. Um, We do believe uh, that there will be a surge of bankruptcy filings at some point in the the near future, probably after the first of the year. Um, Just to give you some idea, as a bankruptcy trustee, I used to get about uh, 40 cases a month assigned to me. And it went down to 20. Um, and just recently, at least for my next calendar, the filings are up for the first time in about three, four, five months. And so uh, maybe we're starting to see the turn now, but I'm, I'm not sure of all those statistics on a general basis. Eventually, the special protections you cited against uh, collections and the extra benefits that help people uh, stay solvent are going to expire. After that happens, When should people consider bankruptcy or at least thinking about bankruptcy? Well, I think they should be thinking about it now 
particularly if they don't know what the situation is going to be for them when these um, protections stop. Um, particularly with regard to uh, the mortgages, most of the mortgages, either if they weren't mandated to not collect the money, they, they voluntarily put in forbearances for three or four months, and they've taken the position that once that uh, three or four month period ended, they want three or four months payments that weren't paid before. And that's really very unrealistic view because people who weren't working before, even if they are working now, aren't going to be able to do that. So the time to think about what you might do in the future is now. Um, prepare for the uh, worst and hope for the best, basically, because that way um, you'll be in the best position, no matter what happens, to take the proper action. So if someone is underwater or thinks they will be underwater soon, under with have more debt than they have assets, what should they do or, or not do? What are do's or don'ts so they, they, they can take advantage of bankruptcy? And we'll talk in a moment about how it affects their home ownership. Sure. So if they talk to uh, someone who's experienced in bankruptcy, that person can explain to them what assets they can keep in bankruptcy and what assets might be lost. So just a quick example, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was uh, the situation where I mentioned about uh, using monies to pay unsecured creditors from your pensions and your retirement account. For the most part, those types of accounts are exempt from the reach of creditors. So we've seen situation, sadly, where people may have had twenty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, even more, in pension and retirement accounts, and they use that to satisfy uh, their unsecured debts that they otherwise would have been able to completely discharge and 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 retain their retirement accounts. So there are people who have saved for decades in some instances who've lost their retirement completely because they didn't know that they could save that money, file the bankruptcy, and discharge their unsecured debt, credit cards, guarantees on business loans, things like that. So just to be clear, there's some debt, debt they can discharge without reaching into their assets, their retirement assets, and their otherwise protected assets. And there's other ways they can use to manage their assets to stay in their home. That's Tell exactly, us about that part of it. That's exactly right. So how will that work, staying in their home? So with regard to staying in a, in a home, um, that gets to the issue of exemptions. Um, in New York, people can opt to take either the federal or state exemptions. Um, depending on which scheme you take, you have to follow through. In other words, you can't mix and match. Uh, in New York, downstate, Nassau County, and the, and the surrounding um, boroughs uh, in, in New York, uh, the homestead exemption is $170,825 for a house that you actually live in, that is your residence, meaning that after mortgages and if tax liens uh, are paid, if there are any on the property, um, the debtor is entitled to keep the next $170,825 before any unsecured creditor could get at that money. Including, uh, including, a ju- including a judgment creditor. So, Ro, generally speaking, if your house is worth 500000 but you owe 350000 to the bank, your equity is 150000 and you can keep that equity in a bankruptcy filing. That's correct. Okay, and that's important for homeowners who have some equity. Do they also need the ability to pay that mortgage going forward? This is a misconception some people have. They say, oh, I filed for bankruptcy, and they think they got out of you know, get out of jail free card and they no longer have to pay the mortgage. What basically happens is on the filing of the bankruptcy petition and when the person winds up getting a discharge, in order for them to continue to remain in the property, they have to pay the mortgage because the bank is entitled to foreclose on that property at, you know, at some point if they're, if they're not being paid. The key there is that if someone receives a discharge, they will no longer be personally responsible for the underlying note. In other words, when someone takes out a mortgage on a house, they provide the bank with a note that's a promise to pay, and they also provide a lien, which is the mortgage against the property. So what bankruptcy basically does, it takes away the ability of the bank to sue the homeowner for a deficiency if the house winds up not being worth as much as uh, as the bank the bank is owed. And Ken, I also wanted to point out that homestead exemption is doubled if a husband and wife file bankruptcy and they both own the house. So we see many instances where uh, a couple 
who are married, they have a homestead exemption in excess of $340,000 on a home. Right. And what will they have to prove to show that they are earning enough to continue to pay off the mortgage going forward? Well, that gets into uh, the different types of um, bankruptcies. Chapter 13 is what's called a wage earner plan, where if you're behind on the mortgage and you haven't worked out something outside uh, of, the, of, the, of the bankruptcy with a forbearance or a modification, changing the terms, you are going to have to have in your budget enough money to pay the mortgage, um, payments that become due after you file, the monthly payments, and you're going to have to have enough money in order to uh, satisfy whatever the arrears might have been. That's the amount that was owed on, on the date that the bankruptcy petition was filed over a period not to exceed five years or 60 months. Can you borrow from some of your retirement assets in order to do that? Yes, you can do that. Maybe a relative can give you a gift. You can borrow from some of your retirements uh, or and, and otherwise try to come up with a plan to make payments. Right. You just need to have regular income or commitment by somebody else if they're going to assist that person in fulfilling the requirements of the Chapter 13 plan that they find. And if you got a new job, even if it didn't pay what you were earning before, that would help in that effort? Absolutely. Okay. What are some other, if you did go into bankruptcy because of, let's say, COVID, you also will be able to discharge many other debts, and that would include credit card, credit card debt and other types of debts so that you have less of a drag on your income? That's right. Um, there are many debts that uh, are capable of being discharged in uh, bankruptcy. Uh, credit card debts generally are the types of debts that can be discharged, but there are some types of debts that um, can't be discharged for public policy reasons. And, and also, if you were a high earner and you have substantial uh, earnings and stock and money from stock and other assets, it's not going to be as easy for you to take advantage of bankruptcy because of the means testing. Right. In order to file bankruptcy, there has to be a determined made as to whether or not you are subject to the means test, and if you are subject to this means test, whether or not you pass it. So I just want to reiterate, we're talking to Andrew Thaler. He's a very experienced and honest and helpful bankruptcy attorney. He's been doing it for many years. He's also been appointed as a trustee of the court to oversee certain types of bankruptcy for the last 30 years. So he can give clients, whatever their means, honest advice about whether bankruptcy is an option for them. Let's say someone is not really, they don't qualify, bankruptcy is not their best scenario. What are some of their other options? Some of the other options might be to try and do a debt settlement, something that people can do on their own, which would basically be negotiating with each of those creditors to agree to take um, either money over time, um, take a lump sum uh, payment for a reduced amount of the debt. Um, that's all a negotiation. And the difficulty with that generally is that unless you get a certain percentage of all those creditors, an amount of debt uh, to agree to what you're proposing, um, it just may not make sense to settle with some of them if you're still left with a lot of debt. So I say that's something you can do on your own. Uh, there are a lot of companies out there that... Um, off their services, saying that they will do exactly what I just mentioned to you, but you do have to be wary because there are a lot of companies that take people's money and they don't deliver the goods, so to speak. They don't do the work that's required. They just take a certain amount of money every month and say that they're going to do these things, and they don't. Um, there are reputable attorneys who do it. Personally, I think the only people I would retain would be probably attorneys and someone who is only going to charge you something if they're successful. They basically charge a success fee, which is a percentage of the amount of money that they save you. But that's a win-win situation. So they're only being paid if they help you negotiate down your debt. That's right. But the key issue here is you need money in order to negotiate with these, with these creditors. And a lot of times uh, the creditors don't have, don't have the money. Um, I find generally for... People who have significant enough debt where they're not going to be able to retire it over the last four or five years, if they have a lot of um, income which is going to disqualify them from filing a bankruptcy petition, that's a situation where you go to one of these entities because you can wind up settling your debt or making a payment plan uh, with a, a debt settlement uh, arrangement. 
that may not fly in a chapter 13. In other words, when you file a chapter 13, they um, examine your budget very carefully and they restrict the amount that you can spend on certain expenses. So you may not be a candidate for chapter 13 if you're not prepared to give up your lifestyle. Some people want to go out to dinner. That's not something uh, that you know is, 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 is put into the, uh, into the equation or you may have a child that's going to college College expense is not something that the bankruptcy laws allow people to include as an expense. The law basically says that's money that should go to creditors. And on college, that's in terms of financial planning, you want to be careful about signing on as a creditor for student loans and college loans because that can adversely affect your position in bankruptcy. Well, certainly student loans are not dischargeable in bankruptcy at, at this point in time. And if you sign, if you co-sign the loan as a parent, which colleges may encourage you to do, that's going to adversely affect your credit worthiness going forward and your ability to obtain bankruptcy. That's correct. Well, you, you may be able to file bankruptcy and discharge other debts, which could help you out significantly, but the, uh, the student loan debt is most likely going to survive the bankruptcy. Um, and so you're not getting the most benefit out of the bankruptcy if you still have some debts which are not being, which are not discharged. And it's also going to be a drain on your assets and your income. So you just have to think carefully about co-signing any kind of loan, but especially a, a student loan. That's right. Same thing goes for um, business loans. It may be impossible to start up your business or to get the funding that you need, but people should um, uh, uh, avoid as much as, uh, as is humanly possible signing off on a personal guarantee for a business obligation. They should really not do that. And that would even include a car loan because whenever you sign something as a personal guarantee, it's going to adversely impact your financial standing. That's right. And just, I should have covered it with you earlier, but what are the two or three different types of bankruptcy and and their their, their distinctions for individuals? So for individuals, there's a chapter seven, that's straight liquidation. Basically, um, whatever property is not exempt, is subject to control of the bankruptcy trustee and is something that's available to uh, pay creditor creditor claims. Um, There's also a chapter 13 uh, referred to also as a wage earner plan. Uh, That historically was used by people who owned a home who fell behind on a mortgage and needed a time in order to cure the arrears when the the lender was not uh, agreeable uh, to that. Um, so that's the basic benefit of a Chapter 13. You can uh, pay these arrears out over time. In a Chapter 13, your assets are not sold. You stay in possession of your house. You stay in possession of all your other assets. But the plan that you proposed is going to be a combination of paying creditors at least as much as they would get if there were a liquidation. In other words, your non-exempt property has to be valued. You have to pay creditors at least that amount of money. And you have to pay creditors your disposable income going forward over a period of three to five years. So, and, a, and this is 13 you're, you're talking about? That, that's okay. the Chapter 13 reorganization. Um, individuals also can file a Chapter 11, which is another reorganization. Um, it's generally used, however, by uh, corporations. Um, individuals would opt to file a Chapter 13 instead of a Chapter 11 because a Chapter 13 is a lot less complicated um, but Chapter 13 has certain uh, dollar limits that you cannot exceed a certain amount for unsecured debt and secured debt. That's why if you uh, surpass those um, dollar amounts, you may have no choice but to do a Chapter 11 if you want to reorganize. And, and Chapter 13, you do need some kind of income, source of income, so that you can continue to pay something on your home and on your debts. That's right. And you can help a client sort out the possible scenarios and which option may be best for them. Right. One of the first things we do, in addition to the means testing, is to uh, take a very close look at their budget. And we have to calculate how much the arrears are, how much someone needs to live on a going forward basis, on on a a monthly basis, and how much the mortgage is going to be, and how much money is going to be needed for the arrears. In other words, you take the arrears and you divide by 60, which is... is, um, you know, which is, which is uh, you know, five years and months. And uh, the, those arrears, then, you come up with a monthly amount. You need that amount plus the mortgage amount for the current month that you're in, plus all of the expenses that somebody has in order to maintain their household. 
I just want to remind our listeners that we're talking with Andrew Thaler. He's a bankruptcy attorney. He's also been a trustee of the bankruptcy court for the last 30 years. As you can see, he's very knowledgeable about the process and very honest about the process. And he's helped individuals, families, couples, and, and business owners to evaluate their best options in the, in the bankruptcy process or if bankruptcy is for them especially considering uh, the impact of COVID. You're listening to Law You Should Know on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of NASA Community College. If you missed any part of this program or you'd like to tell someone, someone else about it, just go to the podcast of this or other programs about the law at nccradio.org. Is there a certain stigma attached to bankruptcy? Well, that's not really true, especially given the pandemic and just sometimes, you know, Donald Trump has filed bankruptcy many different times for his various businesses. Is there less of a stigma? There definitely is less of a stigma than there was 30, 40 years ago. For the reasons that you mentioned, a lot of household names have filed bankruptcies, corporate bankruptcies, uh, and uh, uh, prominent individuals have filed bankruptcies uh, for various reasons. So um, it doesn't have the stigma that it once had. And if you lost your job or you were ill with COVID or something else, it's not really your fault. And bankruptcy is giving you a chance to have a clean, fresh start. Right. But there are consequences to that. What are some of those, let's say, inability to get credit or a mortgage? What are some of the possible consequences of filing a bankruptcy and ways to deal with them? That's a great question, uh, uh, Ken, because uh, I can't tell you how many people came into my office and they have 15 credit cards. And they've run out of the money, run out of money from all the sources that I just mentioned to you before. You know, they've tapped into the home equity loans. They've taken their pensions. They borrowed as much money as they can from family members. And uh, they robbed Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. They can't even get any more credit cards. And they say to me, Andy, but, I, you know, I have a 750, uh, you know, credit score, and I don't want to lose that. The reality is, is that they're at the end of the line. They're not going to be able to service the debt that they have. And once they stop paying those, uh, those, those debts, the credit score is going to go down. What bankruptcy does is when you file a bankruptcy and you, get, uh, and you get your discharge, you wind up becoming a better credit risk to a credit manager because now your, your credit report is going to show, yes, you did file bankruptcy. And it's obviously not something that people would necessarily want on their credit report. But it's also going to show that all those credit cards, they're no longer owed any money. The person that doesn't file for bankruptcy, whose credit, credit score is going to go down, is going to be in a worse position. So the sooner that you file the bankruptcy petition, if it's appropriate, the sooner you start resurrecting your credit. Because after you file bankruptcy, we've seen pretty much soon after the credit card company starts sending uh, solicitations to people uh, to extend credit. Now, that, that, you know, that's changed over various times, depending on what's going on you know, in the economy. But inevitably... Even if there's been a cutback on the credit that's been uh, provided by these uh, by these banks and these these lenders, it always comes around again. People can get credit. They can have someone else co-sign on a loan. They can get a secured credit card. Um, and today, a lot of people use debit cards. It's not quite the same as it was years ago, where people said, "I absolutely, positively have to have a credit card." People now can have a debit card where there's money if they don't have to. They don't have to necessarily carry carry cash. And hopefully, learn from their experience. When you file bankruptcy, before you file, you're required to take, number one, a um, credit counseling course. One of the reasons the government set that up was to see if there were more people who should be filing Chapter 13s where creditors wind up getting paid back some money under a plan. And then before you get your discharge in bankruptcy, you have to take a debtor education course. So the government has done certain things in order to minimally educate some of these people, although once the horse is out of the barn, a lot of these people aren't getting the education that they need, you know, beforehand. That's why the things that I mentioned to you before, people should look out for to see if they are running into problems, that they should talk to somebody uh, in order to avoid uh, a bad situation or to have a better bankruptcy than than one where they have absolutely no uh, assets at all to protect. I do want to mention also that, you know, bankruptcy is a little more complicated than time we've had has permitted us to discuss most people can keep their pensions they can keep a motor vehicle up to a certain value they can keep some household goods they can keep certain 
parts of personal injury recoveries and personal injury lawsuits. And that's something you can discuss with them in more detail. What are the, give us your website and how people can get in touch with you and any other suggestions you want to make in weighing their options. Okay. I mean, as far as um, finding me, the best way really would just be type in uh, Thaler, Thaler Law Firm. And that's T-H-A-L-E-R. That's right. And what are some other things they should keep in mind? And they should contact you before they start digging into pensions, before they start borrowing Peter to pay Paul, before they start borrowing money from relatives. Exactly. You were listening. Yeah. <laughs> And the most important thing is you can you can you can list you'll take a good history from your potential client and you help them weigh all their options and whether it's premature to contact you or whether it's time for them to file some type of bankruptcy. Right. So I guess there's one thing I would two things I would mention. One is you already have a judgment against your home. It may be possible to have that judgment removed if it impairs that homestead exemption that I mentioned to you before. Most people believe that all taxes are not dischargeable. Um, Taxes are certainly something that you want to pay because most of them are not dischargeable. For instance, fiduciary taxes are not dischargeable. Those are taxes that uh, shopkeepers collect sales tax and business owners uh, um, uh, take the withholding taxes out of uh, their employees' pay. Those are what we call fiduciary taxes, and those are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Um, However... Some people run into problems with not paying their income taxes, and there are some circumstances where income taxes can be discharged in a bankruptcy. And so we do on occasion run into people who have a lot of income taxes who, that are more than three years old, and there are certain things that have to be uh, satisfied in order to discharge them, but they are capable of being discharged. From the and Andy, very briefly, if someone... If the bank is threatening foreclosure proceedings or has started foreclosure proceedings, is it important they contact you right away to see what their options are before the house actually goes into foreclosure? Yes. So uh, you might be able to help them at that late. The early they see you, the more you can help them, the more you can give them advice. They'll want to put in an answer. They'll want to get the benefit of the most amount of time they can, even though the process, even before covid was a very slow one. It probably took about two years before a house was actually sold in foreclosure. COVID has extended that time significantly. And maybe you can you can try to work it out with the creditor rather than going taking the foreclosure route. That's right. One of the things that we also do is we'll assist um, clients with uh, doing a modification on the mortgage. All the banks have different programs. This is certainly something that people can do on their own. Um, but if people feel that they... Uh, are not capable of doing it. Um, We do assist them with that. And you can have a consultation with them. So I just want to remind listeners, you can contact Andrew Thaler, T-H-A-L-E-R, just Google him. And as you've heard, he's a very experienced bankruptcy attorney and for helping families, individuals, and small businesses. If you miss any part of what he had to say, please go to our podcast at nccradio.org about this or other Law You Should Know shows, and please join us next week at this same time for another program on Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College.